this uh, Eric Lauter. He's the uh, executive director of the Encyclopedia of Life that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And uh, we're honored to have him. And the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Walter. Um, and good afternoon. My name is Eric Mata. I'm the executive director of the Encyclopedia. And I would like to start by thanking the organizers of the symposium for having me here share with you our, our dreams, our goals, uh, and to have the opportunity to learn from uh, our colleagues who are giving these interesting presentations. Also, I would like to start by thanking the MacArthur Foundation and the Sloan Foundation for, for their support for the first five years of the Encyclopedia of Life, which has been, ex has been extended uh, one more year for MacArthur and two more years for, uh, from the Sloan Foundation. The Encyclopedia of Life was born as a concept, I would say, eight or nine years ago, when people started speculating, scientists mainly, about the importance of delivering information, making it available to the general public, to teachers, to students, to other scientists as well. And this was a consequence of the, of the convergence of technologies, internet, multimedia, um, lots of information that had not been digitized but could have been digitized. And Edward Wilson was probably the, the main evangelist of the concept, which five years ago finally um, became a project called the Encyclopedia of Life, with uh, five uh, cornerstone institutions supporting it, in addition to the MacArthur Foundation and Sloan. Um, they are uh, the Smithsonian Institution, Harvard University, the Marine uh, MBL, the Marine Biological Lab uh, at Woods Hole, uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden, and the Field Museum. But of course, pretty soon it became very obvious that it should be a global initiative, hopefully multilingual, um, and that it should include global partners uh, as well. So the mission of the Encyclopedia of Life has not changed. The, the title of this presentation summarizes it. It is to raise awareness and understanding of living nature. Of course, we do this through a, a digital resource, an Encyclopedia of Life, which is free, openly available, uh, highly accessible, and, uh, and trusted. Um, we, we started with this concept about five years ago. At, at the time, I, I was at the National Biodiversity Institute of Costa Rica, where I worked for about 15 years. And we had our own version of a small Costa Rican encyclopedia of life. We didn't call it that way. Uh, but since two years ago, we have tried to take the encyclopedia of life to a new level, um, um, basically by making sure it, it, it's a global initiative that has more partners and that has a governance model that includes the participation of, of all of our global partners. But, well, but what does it mean to raise awareness and understanding of living life? Living life, or, or sorry, living nature or, or biodiversity is, is, really, is really complex. Uh, one way of paraphrasing this, and here I'm, I'm going to be borrowing a, a term that Rodrigo Gámez from the National Biodiversity of Institute coined, um, it is bioliteracy. What we want is to have every citizen in, on the planet to be bioliterate. This means that they should be aware of the value of biodiversity, and more importantly, they should be very proud of what they do to conserve it. It's not easy, but we want every citizen to have a, a green dimension, if, if you wish. But living nature has many dimensions. What does it mean to, to be aware of it and to understand it? Well, first of all, it's beautiful. And this is probably the, the, the easiest dimension to, um, to use uh, to convince people that it's worth studying it and it's worth conserving it. Uh, all cultures have displayed this appreciation for the beauty of, of nature uh, and of living nature in particular. There's a, there's a natural biophilia that we all have uh, and that in many cases, unfortunately, through uh, our educational system, uh, it vanishes. 
We want to rescue that. Living nature is also very diverse. We want people to be aware of that, by the, uh, about th that diversity and also to understand it better. Um, there's a lot of debate on how many species that are really uh, on the planet. Uh, a more or less accepted estimate is 10 million species, not counting, of course, uh, microorganisms. But only a few of them have been identified, named, uh, and properly described. Because there are millions of species, there are potentially billions or trillions of relationships amongst those species. So this complexity is, is, is a big challenge, and here is where we expect scientists to really help us um, decipher the complexity. Most of the information is unknown. We want people to know that, and, and we should make them very aware of the fact that in some cases, we are even losing biodiversity that has not been described. In my, in my country, in Costa Rica, there are hundreds of thousands of insects alone and 80% of them don't have a name. They haven't been described. Um, even larger numbers can be used to describe what happens in Colombia and in general in the neotropics. And finally, um, living nature is indispensable for our own quality of life and for our own survival. And it works the other way as well, of course. We are the main agent um, of uh, the main threat, let's put it that way. To biodiversity. The big challenge, the big umbrella here, of course, is that we would like to support uh, the conservation of biodiversity. But this is, this is huge. This involves governments, this involves NGOs, this involves communities, this invo involves scientists, general public, and so on. So out of this um, more or less accepted now uh, approach to conserving biodiversity that says, in order to conserve biodiversity, we have to make sure we understand it, we use it sustainably, and as a result, we will be able to save it. We focus on the understanding part. We want to make sure that uh, as f uh, with respect to beauty, we learn to enjoy it. With respect to diversity, we understand it better. We can help decipher the complexity of living nature and we can help unveil that big unknown that still remains. And as, as a result, of course, um, we should be able to enjoy services and to be more capable of, of um, making intelligent decisions to save uh, biodiversity. So one way of summarizing what is it that, uh, that we have with Encyclopedia of Life, every word here has a, a heavy weight, and we could spend some time talking about each of these, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. We want it to be free. Um, if you want to use Encyclopedia of Life, you go to our website, www.eol.org, and you immediately have access to all the information. If, if you want to participate, to write up comments and so on, you have to generate an account. And, and that's something that takes one minute. You can even use your Facebook or Google account to uh, avoid you know, memorizing too many passwords and so on. And from then on, you are one of our members. Um, it should be accessible, it should be trusted. This is very difficult because, of, the, of course, there's, there's a balance, there's a trade-off between having large amounts of uh, information and have good quality information. Uh, Steve just made the case for having large amounts of information that, that are statistically representative so that we can infer um, uh, um, scientifically uh, uh, reliable coherent uh, results. To make things harder, uh, an encyclopedia of life should be multilingual. Uh, by default, it started being a, an English language encyclopedia of life, but since last year we have a Spanish language version and also an Arabic language version. The Library of Alexandria has been fundamental in, in making it happen. And institutions like Conabio in Mexico, uh, Imbio in Costa Rica, have made it possible to have rich content in, in Spanish. However, um, the main content is still in English. We would have to wait for an automated process to really turn those more than a million species pages that so far have been developed in English into other um, uh, versions of, of the, the content. Um, it should be built globally. The process through which we integrate that information is not that we started from scratch writing up species pages. 
many countries, many organizations have already developed their own. And what we focus is on importing those databases. We have established standard formats. Unfortunately, and this is a contradiction of terms, there are many standards. So in many cases, we have to do ad hoc procedures in order to integrate that information. But so far, we have been very successful um, at uh, engaging partners worldwide. And therefore, uh, in, in a relatively small amount of time, we have been able to integrate taxonomic and descriptive information for more than a, a million uh, organisms. And of course, the scope is taxonomically is all living organisms, and geographically, it's uh, all organisms from the planet. That's the, the ambitious goal, uh, set of goals that we have. We already talked about the why. And I'd like to present always this this uh, slide because um, it graphically describes what we want to do. Uh, for many years, in different cultures, in many places, our human beings have been aware of the beauty, of the complexity, of the importance of living nature. And, and in a very artistic uh, way, that has been displayed. But we want to go from awareness to understanding. And so this is the new way of describing that horse. This is the new way of describing that beautiful frog from, from Central America. And this is the new way of describing the national bird of, of Taiwan. For each of those species, we have the taxonomic information, we have the natural history, bibliographic references. We have been working with the Biodiversity Heritage Library, BHL. Um, they have really done a monumental work. They have uh, digitized more than f about 40 million pages of literature, literature that describes species. Um, the magic number, I believe, is 1923, 1924. Uh, copyright issues do not apply before that. And so they have focused their attention on digitizing that information. But with special permissions, they have also been able to digitize uh, newer information. Hopefully, New descriptions that come out of, uh, in, in, in digital format, in electronic journals, um, will have more open access. Uh, so there's going to be a gap for a while for publications from the 1920s to, I would say, 2010s. Who is the Encyclopedia of Life? Uh, I told you at the beginning that we started with five cornerstone institutions in the US, uh, and very soon, um, Encyclopedia of Life started integrating participants from, from all over the world. Right now we have 219 content partners. We have more than 90 curators. I would love to say 90 actively engaged curators. Um, I would say about 60-70% of them are actively engaged in vetting the information that we import from different organizations. Sometimes, or quite often I, sh I should say, uh, when we import uh, information from, uh, from an institution that has curators themselves, uh, we consider that information vetted. That's information that has been uh, carefully gathered and we are simply publishing information that has already been vetted. We, we have two ways of participating. We have content partners, about 20, 219 of them, but we also sign memoranda of understanding with organizations that would like to go beyond uh, collaborating um, by sharing their data. Uh, we could develop joint uh, software tools. We could develop uh, joint uh, uh, citizen science activities and so on. Some of or the key or the, the, the most recent international partners are the Atlas of Living Australia, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Naturalis from the Netherlands, Library of Alexandria, uh, Sambi from South Africa, Conabio, Mexico, Imbio, Costa Rica, Academia Sinica in, in Taiwan. We have collaborations between Taiwan and China. Uh, both are generating species pages for Encyclopedia of Life. Uh, A3 in India, and the most recent one, this is as fresh as last week, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Norwegian Biodiversity Information Center. They will be uh, implementing a Norwegian version of the Encyclopedia of Life and they will have the information both in uh, Norwegian and in English. And uh, um, over the last uh, year, we established a new governance model that includes a council, which is an advisory committee, 
and an executive committee that includes most of the um, organizations on the third bullet here, as well as the original cornerstone institutions. Where are we now? Um, we crossed the, the one million page threshold in, in uh, April of this, of this year. I, however, have to mention here that uh, our pages are very uh, heterogeneous in terms of depth. Some of those pages are very rich. They have dozens, if not hundreds of pictures, images, uh, videos, even sounds. Some of them, uh, um, and texts, of course, bibliographic references and so on. Uh, but some of them have the scientific name, common name, and hopefully a link to uh, BHL uh, literature that has been digitized. For, for many scientists, that's enough. That's a gateway to other types of information about that species. And therefore, we have preferred to have this breadth first rather than depth. Um, this is changing, and from this year on, uh, we will start focusing more on providing depth to our species pages. Um, Six, uh, 61,000 uh, registered users uh, um, use our website. We have something new that we deployed last year with our second version of the Encyclopedia of Life in September called Virtual Collections. Virtual Collections are a very simple, very straight, straightforward way of putting together information. Taxonomists have their own way of putting together information via a taxonomy. Unfortunately, I cannot say via the taxonomy, but via a taxonomy. There are many taxonomies, and, and we provide access to, the, to different taxonomies, even for a single species. A virtual collection allows any user to go and click on different species pages and say, I want to put this together. Uh, if you wish, this is my own taxonomy. This, this is the group of species that I'm interested in. What could that be? Well, uh, it could be birds from my backyard, it could be, um, we have one very interesting uh, group or collection called uh, sea monsters, beautiful sea monsters, I should say, beautiful sea monsters. Taxonomically, they don't belong to any specific group. Another one is life is blue. We have morphum butterflies, we have birds, we have uh, fish and all types of blue organisms. And we cannot anticipate um, what is it that people want to do with the information, how, the, how they want to cluster that information. So they do it themselves. We started with 30 last September, and a little over a year uh, later, we have 3,300 virtual collections. I also have to say that not all of these are very rich. Some of those virtual collections uh, were trials, people trying to experience, experiment with this new tool, and they created you know, animals from my backyard, and it has five or six only. Uh, but some of them are very, very exciting, and we couldn't anticipate um, that people would be so excited about it and would be organizing the information in so many different ways. But that was our main goal, to make the second version of the Encyclopedia of Life, which was launched last year, more, more engaging. And we also have the concept of community. Uh, uh, people who are engaged uh, have created the same type of virtual collections or have the same interests. And the growth in terms of images has been outstanding. We were getting to the point of having almost two million uh, images. We use Flickr, we import databases, um, and we have made it as, as simple as possible to, uh, to contribute information. If you visit uh, one of our uh, pages, what you will find is that there's a big sign that says trusted when that has been vetted by, by a taxonomist or by a scientist. And if, if it doesn't have the word trusted, by default, it hasn't been trusted. We, we don't have an untrusted sign there. It would be too, too, too rough. Um, and uh, I had already mentioned that we have more than 200 content partners. I want to give you a quick example of what a species page looks like. And I'm going to use the case of the, the great uh, egret, I think is the name in English. So we, always ha we have several tabs there. Um, first one is an overview. It, it summarizes um, some interesting stuff about the species. 
And then we have the details. The details inclu include a distribution, a descri description of the distribution of the species, morphology, natural history, habitat, uh, bibliographic references, images. In this case, this is very rich. We have, uh, I couldn't get it, but more than 100 uh, images and videos. Uh, you see the trusted sign there that has been vetted by our provider or, or a specialist. We started only with maps provided by GBIF. We now have maps from NatureServe and, and other initiatives, and very soon we expect to have a map of life uh, maps integrated, which will take us to a new level. Um, because so far it has been really shy, our approach to including geospatial information. <clears throat> uh, common names in different languages. Uh, what communities, to what communities this species belong, and to what collections? What collections include this species? And uh, if you want to know more about it, look at our partner links, and you can spend the rest of the day or the rest of the weekend navigating through those references um, and uh, uh, learning more about biodiversity and uh, being more aware of its importance. One point I want to, to make is um, particularly important for the education uh, audience and also for museums and, um, and schools. Uh, we, we believe that EOL provides a, a strong digital platform to support public engagement in biodiversity conservation. And very quickly, I wanted to make sure we cover this, these issues. I already talked about virtual collections how we are streamlining the dissemination of results from scientific research and some efforts in the bioliteracy arena. Um, first example of a virtual collection is one called X-ray vision, fish inside out. This was an experimental um, virtual collection we created to support one exhibit that the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian in DC had uh, started. It is called X-ray vision, fish inside out. So the virtual collection includes all the images um, that are being displayed in that exhibit. So if you go to the exhibit, you can enjoy a good half an hour, a good hour. But if you want to get information about those species, you can come to the Encyclopedia of Life, click on any of these pictures here, and get the information associated with that species. Uh, you could use a mobile device to navigate as you walk around. Uh, frankly, um, I was naive enough to think that that was probably going to be the way people use it, but people don't, don't like to read when they go to a museum. Um, in the best of cases, they go back home and, and they do some additional reading. Uh, but realistically speaking, this works for groups. A uh, teacher who goes with his or her uh, class, um, they visit the museum, and then they can, say, they can say, okay, now we have homework, and your homework is going to be A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, you probably don't remember that, but you can do a, like a virtual visit to the exhibit again if you visit the virtual collection. And, and that's one way of supporting the activities of museums. Um, this is one we got from my, my friends at the Ministry of, of the Environment in Costa Rica. I told them, could you provide me with the list of threatened species? Uh, in Costa Rica. Each country normally defines their, their own list. IUCN has a list, CITES has a list, uh, but countries decide really what is it uh, that is uh, endangered in their countries. So they provided us with a list of uh, names and uh, we created the corresponding, um, the corresponding virtual collection. That automatically, in a way, we can interpret this as, as automatically generating a website for the Ministry of the Environment that contains the information about uh, endangered or threatened species from, from that particular country. Now, the first thing they, they told us was, well, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the, the number, and I cannot see it very well here. Say, we have really 400, and this collection only has 200. And, of course, we said, well, we only have 200 in the collection because we don't have the species pages for those 400. Could you help us develop the species, the, the remaining 200 species pages? Um, 
Fortunately, these that we have here are in Spanish because InBio from Costa Rica is contributing with content in Spanish. Uh, otherwise, uh, we would have it in, in English or Arab or Chinese. Um, but then that motivated them to start developing those remaining species pages. The marginal effort they have to make to have this quote-unquote website is very small compared to what they would have had to do if they had started from, from scratch. We would like to see that you know, in every country, ministries of the environment do the same thing. The platform is there. We just have to make sure that the information is also there. The way to put it together, we also have. Uh, this is another. This is not a temporary exhibit. This is a a, uh, a permanent exhibit uh, about mammals and the Natural History Museum. This is another exhibit. These are pictures. These are not species pages, but pictures. Um, marine biodiversity, beautiful sea monsters. I mentioned before. Recently extinct animals. Dodo. The dodo bird is there, of course. This is another interesting way of putting together the information. And, and the other example I have here, it's very hard to read. It's birds of DC. What, what makes it important is not that, that it's the birds of DC. Uh, DC doesn't have a very rich biodiversity in general. Uh, but it is that this was the first collection that includes iNaturalist observations. We, up until that moment, we had not dealt with specimen level information, observations or vouch uh, vouchered uh, uh, specimens. It's a summary. We are aggregators of information. We pro from GBIF, for example, where they have hundreds of millions of specimen level data, we get distribution maps. That's basically what we get from GBIF. But uh, thanks to the work that, that iNaturalist is doing, we are now also integrating observations, not because we want to do that type of work, but because that information is available. And if you want to look at the details, you can go to the iNaturalist website. Very quickly, um, as a way of anticipating the type of work that, um, I'm sorry, that um, BHL has been doing, we have established, uh, sorry, agreements with um, Pensoft so that from each of their publications, like um, uh, Zookeys and Phytokeys, every time a publication uh, is published, um, it's automatically com uh, transformed or turned into a species page of EOL. That makes us hope that those remaining 8 million species that have to be described, if they are described under this type of platforms, uh, then they will automatically be uh, included in the Encyclopedia of Life. So we are not going to run into the problem that BHL currently is helping us solve. And with Zotaxa, we are doing the same thing. A couple of minutes, Walter? Sure. Okay, citizen science. Um, we, we have pro developed materials, I would call it uh, maybe a teacher's corner, with podcasts, with tools, with introductory materials uh, for children and for, to support K-12 education. But more recently, we developed this partnership with iNaturalist. iNaturalist has been very good with um, 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 uh, citizen science activities. They have their own website, which is here, this one that I'm showing here. But they have something called projects. Uh, projects, such as the one described here, are ways of putting together observations because uh, of their geographic scope or because of the interest that people have on a specific subject. And that is very similar to the concept of virtual collections. So uh, we now have synchronized the creation of, of projects, so those that have an EOL uh, branding there. Those are projects of iNaturalist, which in turn are also Encyclopedia of Life virtual collections. So as people make observations and put those observations in one project, those observations become part of the distribution map that is displayed in the, in the corresponding uh, virtual collection. This is uh, a particular project in, called Birds in North American Cities uh, at the iNaturalist site. And this is the corresponding virtual collection uh, in, in EOL with the very same map appearing in the, in the description. And we took it one step further, 
by um, developing a, a mobile application for iNaturalist that makes it simpler. You download a virtual collection to your mobile device from the Encyclopedia of Life. You go to that national park, that place. You take pictures. You add those pictures to, to the virtual collection. The virtual collection is like a checklist that you use during your uh, day of activities, of observations there. And if right there you have access to internet, you can download that and it goes at the same time to, to the iNaturalist website and becomes part of, of that uh, project. And that also goes into the virtual collection, enriches the virtual collection. Um, I mentioned uh, that we have content in Spanish, Arabic language, and English. Last July, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, inaugurated a Mandarin uh, version of the Encyclopedia of Life. And that means the interface and the content or content uh, is available in those languages. Um, but there's an interesting, in case you are planning on developing a, a project that has a, a global dimension, there's an interesting place called Translate Wiki, where you can have communities of volunteers help you translate normally interfaces of software that you have developed. And uh, we have Catalan, we have um, uh, um, Italian, we have French, we have German. We have 12 different interfaces or 10 different languages for which the interface has been um, localized. Um, and they include, uh, of course, English, Arabic language. This was quite a challenge because the menus you know, are on the right and you, you read right to left. Um, Espanol, German, French. I want to finish up with two, two ideas here. Um, this is uh, for the month of, basically the month of, of May, some statistics about visits. And I want you to just look at the map. Most of the visitors come from, from the US. Uh, it used to be very focused on the US. Uh, now there's a little bit of green in Canada, in Brazil, in Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru, uh, and in Europe and parts of Asia. But the interesting thing is really, to me, that when you look at um, amount of time spent on the website, average amount of time, um, uh, the US is no longer number one. Number one is China, number two, Indonesia, three, Greece, four, Spain, Bulgaria, Portugal, Colombia, Iran, Ecuador, Finland, Brazil, Mexico, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera. The US is number 15. Now, there's, a, there's a, a, a level of novelty that is important here. It's only very recently that we have a Spanish version and, and that we have versions in other languages. Uh, we don't have a Greek version, and we don't have uh, a Portuguese version. So uh, the positive way for me to interpret this is, on the one hand, that still the amount of time, the average amount of time is low, uh, but that there's, there's a market, there, there's a need that uh, initiatives such as the Encyclopedia of Life should meet. That's where we are, but where are we going? Um, there are three key issues that summarize the strategic direction we are following. One is, uh, and I mentioned this before, that rather than focusing on quantity, now we feel we have enough quantity, and now we can focus more on quality, giving more depth to the information. We have a, a list called the the hot list. It consists of 70, 000, around 70,000 species. Um, those are highly demanded. We have species pages for each of them. Uh, but we want to have very rich species pages for all of them. And we are about halfway. We have them all, but we don't have them all at the very rich species uh, content level. We have another even smaller list called the red hot list. That's about 2,500, and we have them. Very rich content in English, uh, which we would like to translate to other, other languages. Computable data, very hard, very hard. Something that we all would like to have. Um, one way of describing that is we would like to have our content, which is very coarsely, coarsely structured into more structured data um, so that data mining can be is, uh, more easily done. 
Right now, it's natural language processing that would have to be used to, to really interpret and extract, for example, geospatial information out of that prose that describes uh, the distribution of, of a species, for example. Uh, the Sloan Foundation is supporting us for two years with a small, very limited scope uh, pilot project to do this. And um, of course, I mentioned that uh, our, our approach to presenting geospatial information has been very timid. Uh, we were relying on GBIF data and what now it's only very recently that we are in, uh, importing information from different sources. Uh, that, um, that is a challenge and that's something we need to provide users with. So hopefully by doing these three uh, main uh, new activities, um, we will be able to provide our general public, our users, with an opportunity to enjoy uh, the beauty of uh, living nature, uh, to um, understand the diversity, uh, decipher the complexity, unveil the unknown, and uh, better understand that it's indispensable and that we should do something about conserving it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, we could probably move it along, but stick around for, for one quick question. And uh, in the meantime, could Ben already come up? Um, Excuse me. So, uh, quick question. Any questions, Ron? I just wonder if there's going to be a, a, a dynamic component to this. Let's say you've got a, a, a climate change in some area that suddenly changes the species distribution. Does that get into the into your database somehow? There are two ways that that could get into the database. Uh, one is if our provider, so a lot of our providers, makes a change and we regularly import according to to the availability of the information. We agree with our content partners and we say every month we're going to import their information for a year, for a week. Um, so if they update that, automatically that's going to be updated on the species page because we import it, say, in a month, that's going to be important. Another way is if you have an account uh, as a curator, you can make the update. You can go there and update the information for red comments, and that, that's going to be part of the species page description. So, yes, it can be done, and there are 